Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Steve Teresi. I'm the VP of Tech Services here at JL Audio. We have a new guy. <laughs> this is Matt Mergenthal. He actually just recently joined the training team, but he's been part of the JL Audio family for quite some time now. He's worked in our R&D department, doing a bunch of really cool stuff over there. He's really good with a lot of this stuff, and we brought him over to the training side to kind of help me look a little bit better. That ain't working. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Matt, why don't you go say hello to everybody? Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Fantastic. And the man from the far west coast is Mr. Rob Haynes. He's our producer and monitor of our chat today. Please say hello, Rob. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. Real quick, we're already having complaints about Matt's baby beard not being on Kevin's level. Ah. I know, Zachary. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you He's know, working I, on it. He's already uh, he's made a commitment to let that grow in. And as soon as he does, I'm going to tell him that he has to shave it. So. <laughs> yeah. And uh, a quick welcome to Matt. Obviously, I've known Matt for years. And... Uh, Cool to be working with you, especially uh, I did a training in Philadelphia back in 2017 and some young up and comer who was told to go to this JL audio training and learn approached me and I'm like, oh God, why is this guy bugging me? Leave me alone. I want to go to my hotel. <laughs> and who would have thought all these years later, he's my peer. So welcome to the team, Matt. That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it, Rob. And the man of the hour is none other than Mr. Nick Ames, joining from our Phoenix location. He's got some special stuff for us. Please say hello, Nick. Hello, Nick. Very good. <laughs> He's been working with us for a while now, huh? So uh, last week, if you joined us or watched the video in, uh, from then till now, um, we covered a deep dive into what phase is. And Nick did a really awesome job using an oscilloscope and making uh, parallels between what we see on an oscilloscope and what we see in uh, Tune software and, and things of that nature. Um, so that gave us some foundational knowledge of how phase kind of works in, in what would be, I guess the best way of calling it is a more ideal world, a very controlled environment. And that kind of just gives us the background. But what we really want is how do we work with phase when we're looking at a real audio system? So that's what we're going to do today. But I do want to get into some background of where we come from with some of this stuff and uh, in the tuning process where this would come into the process. So I'm going to share my keynote presentation here somehow. Oh, I got it up, Steve. Uh, fantastic. But I got to see it on my screen as well. So this is our recommended tuning process. And hopefully you've seen this before. But we'll just quickly go through the steps the way we understand them, right? Steps one and two people always ignore, but I keep saying over and over, this is the two most important steps. If you don't design your system properly and use the right equipment and you don't install it right, you can't fix that with a DSP. So if you don't get those two things right, you're going to kill yourself on the back end. So make sure you do that right. And before you start adjusting anything, you got to make sure that your initial configuration is right. Signals routed the way it's supposed to be. You got to make sure your left channel is your left channel, your right channel is your right channel. Your mid base is not your tweeter because that could cause some bad things to happen. Once you make sure of all of that, you get into measurements. And we recommend starting with impulse response and setting our initial delays. Then we get into defining and modifying targets based on the measured data, applying high and low pass filters. Then we equalize to target and match our levels, at which point we get to step 10, which is where we're going to talk about today, analyzing phase and interactions between channels. And then we get to listening and, re re and capturing the, the final results. So what we're going to talk about today, we've already checked off almost all of this stuff, and we're going to focus on optimizing the channels. And I want to focus on this just for a second, that in order to do this, you have to make sure that you've set your initial delays. Mm -hmm. Without that initial delay, the time aspect of, of analyzing your channels goes out the window. No pun intended there. <laughs> and out the window, car. Nah. Okay. So... That's what uh, Nick is going to do for us. He's actually going to show us measured data in the car. He's going to walk us through the impulse measurements and all that stuff and show us from soup to nuts how to do all of this stuff. But just to go back and re, you know, remind everyone about a more perfect situation like with sine waves, I wanted to show you these, and hopefully you've seen this before as well. What you're looking at is two sine waves that are playing starting at the same point in time. Both of the things on the left of your screen there, the, um, the black and the blue, it's hard to tell the difference here, but the black and the blue waveforms both start at the reference line, the zero line. They rise to a peak at the same time. They go back to the reference line, the zero line, and then go down to another peak, a, a, a lower peak, the bottom peak, and so on and so forth. One's four volts and one's three volts. So the question I have for the audience, should we wait for an answer, Rob, is if it's a four volt peak and a three volt peak. Yeah, I think we can, yeah, we should have some time. I think as we talk about what should we do, that should okay. give enough people time, maybe, to put an answer into the chat. Can Matt move six inches? Okay. 
So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, He's such a noob. Yeah. He doesn't even know where to stand. <laughs> so if we take the four volt peak and the three volt peak when they're lined up like this, what is our new voltage? What would the peak voltage be at this point? We will see what comes in on the chat here. It's very I'm hard at some math. Of the comments, by the way. Very hard math. Yeah. Make sure you carry the square root over the <laughs> dividend of the equation. We have a fairly small audience too, so I don't want to wait too long yeah. waiting for an answer. I think the stream has already caught up to us. Yes, it has. These lazy guys aren't going to give us an answer. I'm going to have to jump in. <laughs> It's seven volts. Four plus three <laughs> is going to give us seven volts. That's pretty easy. But now what we're going to do is we're going to shift one of the waveforms. We're going to actually start it 90 degrees later. And by doing that, they're no longer starting at the same point. You can see the black one is starting down at that lower point, kind of where the peak would have been um, on that particular waveform. And it's shifted by 90 degrees. You can see that just to the right of center. It's still four volts plus three volts. But now when we do the math, it's not quite as easy. The area that we're focused on here is this interaction between the two waveforms. And it's not drawn to scale because it's kind of hard to draw to scale. But that area marked with the X, we want to know how much voltage you'll get there. And since we didn't get an answer for the 4 plus 3 when it was easy, I'll tell you this one. It's not 7 ever. I don't know what the actual value would be because I didn't bother doing the math. But the point is you'll never get to the full 4 plus 3 because they're not lined up in time. Final illustration using sine waves is this one. There's actually three uh, waveforms on the screen. There's a blue one, which is one waveform. There's a green one, which is exactly the same, but it's behind the blue one. And they're adding together to equal the red one. And what we are going to do next is we're going to put the animation in process, and you'll see them shift. The blue and the green will shift in time, and the resulting red waveform is also going to shift with it in terms of how it sums together. In the center of your screen, you'll see a couple of lines that are, are kind of stuck to the waveform. So you can see how each one is moving relative to each other. And when we put that in action, you can see that when the peaks line up in time, we get the full waveform, the seven volts, if we use our numeric example from before. But as it shifts away from that, it's less than seven to the point where it actually can be completely zero. That's when they're shifted 180 degrees out of phase. This may look a lot, we, we were talking about this earlier, it may look an awful lot like a flipped polarity, but in this case, it's a shift in time, not a flip in polarity. It may look the same, but the behavior is actually very different in the time domain. But again, this is all waveform stuff. This is all beautiful, perfect stuff. And we want to get away from that and jump into actual live measurements with Mr. Nicholas Ames. Please take it away, Nick. Um, hi. Okay. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I can't see the demonstration that you're giving right now. I can only listen. It's all good. Um, my I did a perfect job. Just trust me. I 100. I did. Um, okay. Well, where so where do we want to start? Um, I guess I let me explain where we're at here and what what it is that we're looking at. I've got a system in a in a real car, um, and um, I've kind of coarsely aligned all of the individual responses. So we've got like tweeter, tweeter, mid range, mid range, mid base, mid base, and then. We've got a couple of amps uh, that are powering some subwoofers, and then we've got another amp that's on some rear speakers. Um, but anyway, I've kind of coarsely aligned the responses so that they all uh, match uh, EQ and level, so that they all match up uh, to their targets, to the assigned target responses. Um, so from here, um, this would be the point in the tuning where you would uh, start to look at how they interact with each other and start to adjust things um, like delay and uh, polarity and that kind of stuff to optimize the interactions between all these different speakers. So um, I suppose one thing we could we could start with is show the, the target responses for the front stage. And uh, let's see, maybe I need to bring them down a little. No, they're, they're not too bad. So there's like my front left tweeter, and then I've got a front right tweeter, and then mid-range so what i normally do is uh whenever i get to this point i normally start at the mid bass speakers um because one of the things that's really important to me like you know if the customer came to pick up his car early or something or uh, you know just really important to me is like uh how well the mid bass speakers are interacting with each other and then how well those uh two uh, interact with the subwoofer so that that's kind of the critic most critical well, that's one real critical thing. Um, so I always like to optimize that. So, um, so that's actually, uh, 
sorry to interrupt, Nick. That's a great point you brought up. You know, we, we've been preaching through all of our tuning sessions and configuration. Always oh, start, you know, left, right, high frequency down. But with the phase, what really matters is what Nick said is that subwoofer and mid bass transition. So going to do it a little backwards here and actually start with the lower frequencies when we look at the actual interactions amongst the drivers. Yeah, it's a really good point, Rob. And Nick often yells at me because I'll make a statement that's not entirely accurate. Uh, the mid bass transition from left to right is the first thing. Make those operate as one. So now you have a single phase trace for those two drivers because they're working together in time. Then match that to the subwoofer. And you can continue that all the way up. But I often say you don't really need to do that. And Nick always correctly is like, but you can. And it only takes a few extra minutes. Why not? And he's right. You can do it all the way up. For today, I think we're just going to focus on the left and right mid bass, matching that to the subwoofer and just lather, rinse, and repeat. Continue doing that all the way up the scale for as many drivers as you have in your system. And once you know how to do this, you'll see that it's actually pretty quick and easy. Right. Yep. Yep. So um, so I guess, let's see, at this point, if I, if I were to go about tuning a system in this order like I did today, um, probably the first thing to do from from here moving forward would be to uh, align all the speakers in time, which we have shown in a, I'm going to hide the target responses real quick, just so to clean up my graph up here. Um, we have shown this in a previous, um, a, a, a previous uh, training once I remember, but um, we, we can do it again. So what I would do is zoom in on, you know, the first speaker and anyway, I just need to set my reference delay for my transfer function engine here. So, um, well, the easiest way for me to do that is to just look at the beginning of the impulse response and right click. And uh, and then that sets the um, reference delay value for wherever I put my cursor on the beginning of that impulse response. So I'll set that back to zero. So you can see here, if I move my cursor over, um, you can see it's reading right up, right up in here. You'll see the 4.3 milliseconds or so. So you can either type that in, you know, or you could just right click and it'll enter that value. And then um, what I would do is mute that speaker and go to the next one. And if it's showing up to the right, then it's the next uh, candidate for being the reference. So then that one becomes the new reference. And so that one's ahead. So uh, that one's back even further. So that one's the new candidate for the reference signal. And this so everyone one follow what Nick is doing. So what he's doing, he's looking at every single channel and seeing where in time the first signal from each speaker is arriving at the microphone. Now, he started with the left tweeter, which we all knew was going to be wrong. But you start with that and you have a pattern. So you start with that one and you set your reference. Then you look at the right tweeter and here in the States, that's going to be further away. And it was. So he said that is the new reference. And now he's going to look at every other channel to see if it's either to the left or beforehand, at which point he'll ignore it, or to the right and arriving later. We're looking for the latest arriving impulse response, and that's going to be our new zero. That's going to be the beginning of our time. Because believe me when I tell you, you cannot speed up time. You can only delay time. So when you add delay, what you're actually doing is pushing that signal to line up with the latest arriving speaker. So he's literally going one by one and finding that latest arriving speaker. And once you figure out how to do this quickly, you can bang through this in you know, 30, 40 seconds for uh, a three-way plus sub system. Yep. So, um, okay. So this one, you can see it's coming in a little, a little bit earlier. And you know what? Here's a little trick that I do a lot. A lot of times I'll look at the log for doing this time stuff. So, um, so that, that one's a little early, so I know that I can delay that one so it's not a candidate as the latest arrival. See that? Now, that one's a little bit later. See there? So that one will become the new reference. And, and when you're using Tune software uh, with the, the measure capability in Tune 4.0, um, you do have the ability to switch between linear and log IR. Um, I find lin is a little easier for me at first when I'm first looking at it, but if you're more comfortable with log, no problem at all. Once you get them all lined up, I like looking at the log because it's easy to see how well lined up they are. But we give you these options because we know that there's different ways of looking at the data. So whatever makes you comfortable is the best thing. And the zoom controls that Nick was showing earlier, those can be your, your best friend. You can zoom in on it and actually see what's going on. Yep. Yeah, the zoom controls are, are really useful. Um, so, okay, so let's see here. That's a, that's a mid-bass speaker. So now if we... 
come down here to one of the subwoofer amps. Now, this particular install is unique in that um, there's two sub amps, each powering an individual sub, and they're in they're actually getting stereo signal. I don't know that that's really all that necessary. I don't. I would probably just sum left right to each sub, but they are. That's how the customer wanted it, so that's how they got it. Um, so, okay, so that one was a little later, so that became the new reference. And uh, did I skip a sub amp? I did. Okay, so let's go into this one. And uh, here's that other sub. Ah, uh, the beauty of the live demo. Hey, look, and those two subs are coming in at the same time. <laughs> go figure that, huh? Right next to each other. In the, in the, in what the I find that's really cool, Nick, is you can go through the network and switch to a different amp, and you don't lose your place in the measure tab. You're right back where you were. Yeah, yep. That is pretty cool. And you can also mute and unmute those speakers from right here. Like I could unmute that speaker on that subwoofer on this other amp that I'm not actually controlling right now. I can unmute it from the network tab. I can't do anything to it, right? I can't make any adjustments on it until I switch over to that amp, but I can, I can unmute it and look at it and that kind of thing. So that can make, uh, make things a little easier when you're comparing how things interact and stuff and, and they're coming from two separate amps. And, and just for the benefit of our audience who, Believe it or not, may not all be using JL Audio DSP product. Really? Yeah, believe it or not. But you could still use Tune and Max to take these measurements and then um, any adjustments in terms of the values you just have to do in your own DSP software. So you'd simply take the, the, the data that you look at on the screen, uh, analyze it, then look at your software and make a corresponding change to affect that data. You know, obviously the benefit of using a JL Audio DSP is it's all integrated in and you make the changes real time on one screen. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Yep. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, okay. So now I have set my reference delay right here. So now all that means is that, um, I have a, a point in the impulse response graph that has this number below it, 8.41. That number coincides with the number in the reference delay field. And so that's so equal to zero, right? At this point, that's, that's zero. That's our reference sign. So everything that's yeah. uh, negative is showing up before it and everything that's positive is showing up later. Yes, exactly. So Thank that's God. our position in time that we're going to view all of the information. And, and we've set that position in time to coincide with the latest arriving energy. And so now, what, since we have delay in the DSP, um, we don't have a, a, an ability, like you said, to advance time, but we can delay time. So we go to the latest arriving energy. We set that as our reference point, And then we can unmute them one by one and scoot them over in time um, until they arrive at this all, all at the... Uh, all at that same point right there. So a fast way to do that is to shift and click in in tune. So that just enters that delta delay value right down here. So you uh, could see that the the original uh, beginning of that IR was to the left of where that new zero is, that 8.41 value. And when he put in the delay, he inserted delay from the difference between zero and where it actually started. So when he does that, now it lines up with the zero. And yep. it's literally the definition of time alignment. We are looking at the time domain and we're aligning it to one point, the zero point. Yep. Yeah. So that's that speaker. And of course, this is, you know, very, very fast when you just get used to going through and just clicking, you know, it's pretty quick. Um, but I'm I'm going pretty slow in explaining things. <laughs> He's going slow. He's doing it faster than I can do it. Um, so we just go through and unmute them one by one and just shift and click and scoots them over in time. We do have some uh, little micro automations on this, like find delay and then insert delta. But we, we absolutely want you to understand what you're doing and looking at the data, just in case the, the micro automation misses, because sometimes noise or odd effects can, can change the way it functions. And we want you as the user, the person responsible for tuning this system to understand the data and determine if it's right or wrong. After all, you're the one tuning it, not us. So. Yep, yep, yeah. Um, and actually, once you get used to looking at the impulse response and just seeing, oh, okay, there's the beginning, and you know that's how I set a reference, and this is how I apply delay, um, your uh, human operator's faster. Than, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Um, so okay, well, so now they're aligned in time, and uh, to the subwoofers, which were in this case the latest, uh, the latest ones. So now at this point is when I would probably switch over to the phase response, and then I might take a look at my mid bass speakers and see how they're, oh, whoops, that's a mid range. Hmm. Um, what did I do wrong here? Okay. Uh, 
take a look at my mid bass speakers and see how they are comparing to each other. Um, so, so actually, if we stop right here, just while you collect your thoughts there for a second, um, the red trace on the top is the phase response of this driver. The blue trace on the bottom is what you would see on an RTA. And by itself, this is just interesting information. But when we were looking at the phase definitions um, with the electrical responses, the, the red trace would have been much, much straighter, wouldn't have any of these wiggles. The wiggles that you're seeing is a result of the actual acoustic response of this driver in this real car. Any reflections or loading issues are all going to be represented. Um, and we're going to try to manipulate it by using the electrical domain, you know, the, the DSP on the amplifier to try to change the data to do what we want in the, in the acoustic domain. Does that sound about right, Nick? Yeah. Yeah. And the phase response also, if you remember what we talked about last week, we just kind of got into what these values represent and what this phase graph shows as far as the alignment of two signals and um, the that's what the phase graph is always showing is the relative time relationship kind of per hertz of two waveforms. And the two waveforms in question are your reference waveform and your measure waveform. So right. in this case, it's the it's the coming from the center mic is the measure waveform and the reference waveform is internally looped back from the DAC. So that's going out the RCA output. It's looped back internally. So that's so, the reference signal. So, so that, we can think of this at the reference is when it started. And the, the measure is when it ended. And then yeah. go through all electronics, including all the wires, every device that's in the signal path, including the time of flight from the speaker to the microphone. It's, a, it's capturing all of that. So if there's anything going on in that entire path, it'll be represented by the red trace. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, and so now, uh, kind of, well, like last week when we looked at what these values mean, the positive and the negative and all that stuff, um, that was interesting and it's it's kind of cool to understand what what it means but um when we when we're looking at um optimizing the interaction of multiple speakers um we kind of ignore this y-axis altogether over here on the phase graph the the up and the axis along the left hand vertical side um we just kind of ignore it it really has no real relevance um so what what i always do is i'll, I'll capture this speaker and, uh, and then I'll, I'll also capture the phase response. And to capture, I'm just pressing the space bar. Um, there is a button that you could click. It looks like a little camera in the lower right-hand corner of each of the graphs that does the capture as well. But um, Nick, as a power user, is really fast at just tapping the space bar, typing in a name and moving on. Uh, yeah. If he even types in a name sometimes. Um, yeah, in this case, I'm not even gonna type in a name. I, I don't care. All I wanna know is I just want that to be captured so that I can unmute this one and compare it. That's right. Fine. So, right. oh, cool. Look at that. That's perfect. <laughs> just, just to be clear about something, if, if you haven't seen this graph before, frequency is along the bottom of the uh, phase graph, right? And you said to ignore the left axis, which is the, the time, right? We don't care about that. But there's also some fuzz at the top right of the screen. Can you just describe that in case anyone hasn't seen that? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, Matt. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so we ignore the degrees markings over here. Um, pretty much. It's not really relevant for what we're doing now. Um, the fuzz up at the top here that Matt's talking about, that's the coherence um, reading. And so what, what that is, it, it might be a little easier to understand what coherence is. Whoops. If we look at the magnitude graph down here. Um, so let me turn this on. Okay. So what the coherence shows now, now the coherence moved down to the bottom graph. So if I have magnitude showing, the coherence will be plotted in that graph. If I don't have it showing, if I have RTA showing, then the coherence gets plotted in the phase graph. Anyway, so to understand what the coherence is, let's take a look at magnitude and I'm going to scale this way in like this. Okay, so this energy way out here, this is basically the noise floor, right? Electrical and acoustic and or acoustic noise floor of the measurement system. Um, and and same, same thing down here. So um, so what this is saying basically is that there is energy being picked up at the microphone in these frequencies, right? It's not completely silent. We're not like in outer space, right? There is literally signal there at these, at these frequencies. It's just that the signal at these frequencies, the microphone is picking up or that is in the ADC, basically in the electronics, you know, um, it didn't originate from the signal that we're generating, right? It didn't, it didn't come from our pink noise. It's just noise 
uncorrelated noise. That's that could be noise from like your shop or if there's a, a, an air compressor or something that might make some yep. noise and you'll see the, the pink fuzz get more intense. And the reason the traces on the bottom are disappearing is we have what's known as coherence blanking. So when coherence gets you know, to a certain point, it'll say, okay, this is not part of our actual measurement, so we're not even going to bother to show it because it just gets messy. And Nick is changing that coherence blanking to show those differences. So if he puts it, you know, to, to some ridiculous value, you, you'll, you'll even start missing some of the actual measure of data. Um, yep. But on the other end of it, you can see how cluttered it can become. So this is kind of a nice feature, this coherence blanking that can allow us to focus in on only the meaningful data for what we're actually trying to analyze. In this case, it's a mid-base driver and the, 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 the RTA or the magnitude response on the bottom is nice and focused and the phase data on the top is nice and focused as well. We, we're not looking at any of the noisy crap at the top end. And that the, the pink stuff, the pink fuzzy stuff is really awesome because we can learn to ignore anything that has a lot of pink fuzz. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and the coherence blanking, it, it'll hide any data that's below a certain threshold, right. coherence threshold, right? So like, watch, I'm gonna mute that speaker. Now everything is being hidden, except for the capture that I made, but all the live data pretty much is being hidden. Now if I unmute, like say a tweeter, see now you just see the tweeter information up here. You don't so see cool. the noise information anywhere else. You just see the sound that came from the sound system and not other sounds, basically. That's like, cool. Thank you for that. that. Let's get back to that phase stuff. There was a really cool example that you showed there that I'm excited about. Yeah. So, okay. And let me uh, mention that this vehicle, I have no prior um, preparation with. So I literally just aligned the uh, target responses um, with EQ and level kind of coarsely got it all aligned. And then I was like, cool, we got this thing starting in a few minutes. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just go from here, right? So I'm, this is as new to me as it is to you guys. So I unmuted this other mid bass speaker and I see, uh, well, it's out of polarity. So up here in the phase graph, I can see that, uh, you know, it's in, it's in the same time and you can tell it's coming in at the same time because of the angle of the phase slope. So for example, this says 1.72. If I take this back to zero, okay, now see the angle of the phase slope of the red one compared to the gray. It's not, it's not at the same, it's not the same angle anymore. So, so adding I, delay changes the angle of the phase trace. Yep. I needed that 1.72. Now that 1.72 that we put in, let me put it back in there. 1.72. Okay. So that was, we put that in using the impulse response. We scooted them all over. So they were all lined up at the same time as each other. So that got the timing pretty darn close here. I'd okay. say, but there's something wrong. Yeah, but it's out of polarity. And so I can just, you know, you can tell that you'll see why I, you can see that so easily. See, look, if I flip the polarity, now they're on top of each other. If I flip it back, it looks like they did. So what I'm guessing, let's look at the yeah. Okay. See, they're all at so whoever wired this, um, one of the speakers are wired backwards. That's Oops. all that. <laughs> so that happens. But if you don't mind, just go ahead and flip that polarity again. Yeah. Please. Or wait, hang on. Actually, well, technically, it could also be that it could also be that in the input mixer, one of these is flipped. No, they're not. Okay. The input signals aren't flipped. So, all right, never mind. I just wanted to say it, you know, because there is one other possibility, right? There's another place where polarity can get inverted. So, and, and this kind of goes back to we're looking at everything between where the signal started at the signal generator on Max and going through every piece of electronics, including the software, before going through the driver and out to the uh, to the microphone. Yep. Yep. Indulge yes. me. Flip that polarity, please. Yep. So when I see this, I'm thinking, wow, that's really cool. Because remember, the goal is to align them in time. And if phase is time, mm -hmm. that's pretty darn good. We are really well aligned in time right there. Now, I do see a deviation above 500 hertz to uh, what, about 900 hertz. There's a, a change there. Is yep. that something that we should worry about? Um, well, maybe. But, you know, one of the, and what, what I say maybe, what I mean by that is, um, what we can do now is now that they're aligned in polarity and time, we can capture this one as well down here on the bottom and then unmute them both at the same time. And what we ought to have is a, you know, a nice summation all the way across their bandwidth. What so do you mean by summation? What is, can you describe that a little bit better? Um, sure. Where, okay. So look how the, the, the current live data, which is the blue trace, it is higher in level 
than either of the contributing two traces. So remember, I captured one speaker, then I muted it. I captured the other speaker, then I muted it. Then I then I played them at the same time. And so now I can see how they interact because I have both of the original speakers captures on the screen. And so now with they're both unmuted, the um, combined energy of both of them, the summed response is what we usually refer to it as, the summed response should be higher than either of the two contributing responses. And if it was um if it was an electrical signal for each of the other traces and they summed perfectly, what yeah. could we expect that blue trace to be in terms of level above? Uh, six dB. So you'll you'll get a six dB increase in level if the two contributors are at the same frequency response and in the same time. They'll add and that would be exactly the same time. And in this case, the red and the gray trace are not exactly the same, but they're really darn close. Really darn close. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see what, what we actually do have here. Here's a place where red and gray are pretty close together. So 5.1 or so up there, 5.1 dB. So, so in, uh, in the actual, formation is 5.1 dB, just a slight difference off of a, an ideal perfect electrical summation. Yeah, yeah. So it's somewhere around 6 dB, right? That's what you ought, you ought to see about a 6, 6 dB increase in level if the two contributors are identical. Um, Can you so, flip the story yeah, yeah. real quick and show the, the summit, the combined sum? I'm sorry, say that again, Steve. If you flip the polarity on one of the mid-base drivers now, we can see what would change with the oh. summation of one that's out of polarity with the other. Yeah, let's. I'll flip this one back that we changed a second ago. Let me do that. There you go. No surprise, we're missing a lot of energy <laughs> because they're canceling each other out in time. And yep. that, that makes total sense. And if we're seeing that in the phase domain and seeing the, the summation, I think is very, I think it's helpful. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. And standing outside the car here, I can hear that as well. You can sure, hear, hear sure. very different, sounds very different. Um, so this area up here that you asked about a minute ago, let's take a look again at that. So let's see, I guess it was this one. Yeah, yeah. like from 500 to 900, yeah. Yep, so um, right up here at around 900 hertz or so, that's when we're getting close to the noise floor. So I would probably say that really doesn't matter you know, um, however, you could back a little bit of delay off of this and that would move that red trace closer to the gray. Um, so if I back a little bit of delay off. As he does that, remember when he added delay, it, it increased that angle and now he's removing it. So he's decreasing it and moving it the right. other way. Right. And so, yeah, so you could, you could, you could try to get it a little closer maybe, but it's, it's really it looks like that might be more of a problem with the frequency response right nick um Maybe. yeah i would well let, let's take a look at our sum result again while he's doing that i still i i say it every time i get so excited when i watch these live Me measurements too. and right. him changing the delay and just watching the traces move over one another it is so cool yeah i agree rob i, I, I get giddy too i'm smiling so yeah, maybe, I don't know, you know, whatever, 1.72 or whatever I just had a second ago, 1.20, right? The difference in the summed response is 1.20 probably has a little bit better uh, total summation up here at the top. It's pretty minuscule. I mean, it's not, you wouldn't really be, you know, it's not a make or break situation one way or the other. The reason why I called it out, Nick, is uh, sometimes when you're looking at the phase traces, they're not always going to be as perfect as what we're looking at here. There may be some oddity. And once you're familiar with looking at the way phase, um, the, way the phase of drivers interacts, you can start making determinations of what you chase and what you could probably ignore. And in this case, that that uh, that weirdness up, to, up at the top end of this mid base driver is something we could probably ignore because everything else is so darn good. Um, you, you'd be giving up some of the so darn good in favor of a possible maybe. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, the, the mid base is going to start handing over to the mid range. Right. At that point. And so anyway, yeah. Yeah. I think that's good right there where it is. I'd probably leave it 1.20. So now that we've got them lined up, what's our next step? Well, so I guess what I would do now is um, I would hide that first phase trace that I captured. And now I would just capture this phase trace up here. And that's my new reference for other stuff, right? So I know that my subwoofer needs to uh, combine in with this captured response in such a way that it seamlessly just extends 
the response. It doesn't change its angle. Um, it just extends it. Um, so so I'm a little slow sometimes. I just want to make sure I got this. We looked at the left mid base. We captured its phase and its magnitude, or the RTA. Then we looked at the right one and compared the phase to the left one, and we captured its um, frequency response as well. And mm-hmm. when we got them dialed in, then we captured them together as a group because now they're operating as a, almost like a single channel in terms of the time domain and their, their response characteristic. So now with these combined mid base drivers that are already very well aligned, we're going to try to extend that alignment down to the low frequency where the subwoofer is going to pick up, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, probably one of the other things I do too is hide those other two traces. So I just have the summed response. I have the summed phase and the uh, the orange down here on bottom, that's the summed uh, RTA response of the mid base speakers. One thing I want to point out is um, Nick is going quickly through this uh, to to illustrate the examples. When you're tuning your own system using this, we do recommend that you actually label the traces so that when you go to recall them, you can see what they are a little bit better by just looking at the descriptive name that you put. And we also recommend, of course, saving that to your computer, which it does automatically. So even if you delete the trace from the, the, the measurement window, you can always load it back in. And with the proper name on it, you'll know what it is. So, Yeah, yeah. If if you want to go back and look at this data again at some point, it's definitely helpful to name it correctly, <laughs> for sure. Yes. Um, all right. right I, I got the mid base on. Okay. Yeah, I'm, left, right, mid base, no what? phase correction, left, right, mid base, you know. So what Nick is showing now is that we have the ability of uh, changing the color of the trace to make it more visible. Um, you can do this at any point that you want, but for these uh, these web-based training, sometimes it's hard to see some of the different colors. So that, that yeah. helps. Nick. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next thing I would do, I suppose, is look at the subwoofer or subwoofers if you've got more than one. Um, now, here's a little trick that I often do with with multiplexing, so when when I use multiplexing as opposed to turning off our defaults and using the average magnitude response, um, and it's just easier to manage. Um, but at very low frequencies, sometimes see how the subwoofer whoops, see how the subwoofer response kind of has this little like this long kind of tail to it right here. So um, if you that's a just a fun a byproduct of the the multiplexing the way it currently works. If you turn off multiplexing for low frequency stuff, you can see a little bit deeper into the noise floor. And at very low frequencies like this in a car, um, it doesn't matter really which mic you use. It, it's not very different. In other words, mic to mic to mic. The big differences start coming up above 300 hertz or so, so somewhere in that region, um, above there and up. Um, the differences can get very extreme mic to mic to mic, but that's, that's a really cool trick. And one that uh, I'm learning, <laughs> uh, but something I again, want to point out that our default settings are intended to make it simple for you to get in and start doing measurements. And some of these pro tips that Nick is sharing with us is going to break those defaults, but we would recommend going back to those because most of the time they work really, really good. This is an yeah. excellent way of looking at low frequency better. And it's another example of, we didn't, we didn't put the defaults in and block you out. We put them in to kind of help you. You right. still have full control over every aspect of the, the measurement stuff through Max. It, we didn't we didn't castrate the system by trying to make it easy. Um, right. That was something Nick wouldn't let me do. So <laughs> yeah. So and you know you can just turn it right back on and then hit multi mic. There you go. There's the same response again. But it, you just don't see down into the noise floors deeply. And I right. have an idea for how to in a future update how to make that work could you also maybe zoom in on that graph a little bit nick which one on the rta graph it looks like right now we're seeing about 12 db per step you maybe make it a little bit bigger so we can see a better view of that oh you mean like uh this or yeah the scaling wow how'd you do that (laughs) what 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 magic are you working there (laughs) oh you can you can use your plus and minus buttons on your keyboard and it'll scale the y-axis. Y is the up, down, the vertical, right? It'll scale that in or out. So that's the minus key, and this is the plus key. And that's scaling the capture data as well. Yeah, everything. Yeah, anything that's plotted on that graph is going to get scaled with it. Excellent. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's a good we'll point. Yeah, when, when you're not so far zoomed out like I was, you really didn't matter that you, you know that it looks slightly different with the multiplexing on at low frequencies. Um, 
anyway, so, okay. So our impulse response alignment got us pretty close with these two. Pretty good. Yeah. That's so the, the yellowish curve is the captured pair of mid base drivers phase on the top, right? That that's yeah. that trace. And yep. the red trace is the live data from the subwoofer right now. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep, exactly. Now this subwoofer has a bit of an unfortunate thing going on where there's this null effect right here, like right at the crossover region. That's kind of a bummer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's just see how well the subwoofer sums with the mid bass speakers. So, okay. So there's the subwoofer and the mid bass speakers. Now, if I was to, let's see, if I was so to- So what Nick just did, he's playing both mid-bass drivers and he's playing the sub and he's looking at the combined response, the blue trace on the bottom, which is the RTA. The phase is still um, live on all of it right now. So it's a little weird to look at, but you'll notice that the red trace and the yellow trace line up exactly on part of that up there and only deviates down at the lower portion when the sub starts kicking in because we have not aligned it yet. So if I invert the polarity of the subwoofer, I get a much deeper null here and you can see the phase response right. shifted mm -hmm. to a new position that didn't exist in isolation with just the mid base by itself. So um, this notch that we see here, this is not from uh, a grossly misaligned crossover. That's just a function of the sub has that in its response already. And so when you add the mid base in it, just add mm -hmm. more. You know, so but, this is possibly something happening in the vehicle that's causing this dip or something about the enclosure design or something that maybe can't be fixed with electronics. Well, I mean, I didn't really spend, you know, a whole lot of time like trying to make the sub response match the target or anything super duper closely. Gotcha. Um, I could have, and then that wouldn't be there. Um, and we could, we could do that, I suppose. So, uh, but anyway, I think before we do that though, let's uh let's mute that sub and go back and look at because that right there to be quite honest with you that's not a bad alignment at all no no not at all um so so quick question nick i know in this car it looks like there's two monoblock amplifiers mm -hmm. if that's the case so you have a different sub or amplifier powering each subwoofer would you want to make sure those are perfectly aligned as mm -hmm. well like we did the mid base before we go forward with that's a good question Yep. That's a really good question. Yeah. What I'll do a lot of times in, in, in the scenario like this, where you've got a, a different amp uh, on each sub and the, the way that the user or the installer has set up the system is, you know, they, they aren't running like RCA out from the master amplifier to the two sub amps, in which case, if they were, you could just control the subs from the, from the main amplifier. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, it's, it's optical out from the main amp to all of the amps. And so in order for me to DSP the subs, I have to do that locally in each individual sub amp. So when that's the case, what I would normally do is I would take a look at one subwoofer response, like, like this subwoofer response that I have right here, and I'd capture it, which I already did on the bottom. So I'll capture the phase on the top of that subwoofer response. And then I would mute that one and I'd unmute the other one and I'd look at it and let's see. Okay. And it's right on top. It's so on top that in fact, the phase up here, you probably can barely see that, but if I hide the live, Okay, there you go. You can see the orange behind it. That's the cap mm -hmm. of the other sub. Uh -huh. So I look at those two and I see, oh, okay, they are, for all intents and purposes, completely identical, which I would have pretty much expected uh, by their physical position within the car. So, um, so then that tells me I really only need to work with one in order to figure out how to best align it. So I don't have to sit there and toggle back and forth between one amp and the other amp, one amp and the other. Just work with one of them figure out how to best align it and then move the other one into that same position elect electrically, whatever you did to align the first one, just do the same to the second. And you know, the only thing that's going to happen since they're identical is they're when they're both unmuted is they're going to sum to 60 be higher than either one by itself. So you can figure out how one sub, uh, how to align your subs with the main system by just doing it with one and then just mimic whatever you did on the other. Got you me. don't have to toggle back and forth. The level doesn't affect the phase response. No, 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 not at all. So, so yeah, so that's what I normally uh, do there. Um, so, yeah, this 
this is kind of this is honestly it's kind of a funny response and in fact when this subwoofer is not eq'd or crossed over at all it, it's it's an interesting kind of thing because it's almost like a band pass in in a way it's like a sealed enclosure that fires into a, a large chamber that's sealed off from the rest of the trunk area and that large chamber is vented up through the rear deck lid into the passenger compartment so even with the trunk open none of the subwoofer energy is like you know escapes out the the trunk so the trunk could be opened or closed it doesn't change the response in, in this car so it's kind of like a big giant bandpass kind of box and so it does have a bit of a different yeah, response than just like a sealed subwoofer would have just like a classic sealed box it's not really like that um right. but uh, but anyway yeah so that's that's the way this sub is set up um honestly in this car i would probably leave this alignment like it is I'm thinking the same thing Yep, I would leave this alignment like it is. There, that's that's pretty good, man. I mean, out of curiosity, yeah, if you bit, were able, but you wouldn't gain much if you were able to play both the mid bass and the subwoofer and capture that RTA response. Mm -hmm. Could you then try to add a tiny bit of delay to the subwoofer trace and see if you get more out of that? Mm, sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, to, to be technically like a uh, perfect, we could. So one thing we could do, we could add a little bit of delay to the sub and move this area closer to the mid base. And then right. the area directly delay, below delay. that that'll sum stronger. Right. But the, the further we move this to the mid base, if we, if we start to separate these out more then this area directly below that is going to sum less strongly. Right. Okay. So, um, so we could try it. Let's uh, let's actually do that. Let's uh, so first let's capture it like it is. And this is the sum response. OK, so first we'll capture it like it is. Now what we'll do is uh, we'll go into the subwoofer amp that I've unmuted this one down here. And we will add a little bit of delay to, to, to move this down just a hair. Right. So you're delaying the sub to try to get the, the phase trace to come a little bit closer to the combined mid-base trace. Yeah, see, so it so it did move it closer in this region uh -huh. and, and, and up to here, but it but it pulled it away down here. So anyway, so now let's unmute our mid-bases again, and, and we can do that right from here. We don't have to switch back over. The importance of naming your channels. Yep. And see, yeah, it's really not, it's really not any different. Negligible. It's the same. Yeah. So, yeah. Honestly, that's, that's about as pretty, as, as well aligned as speakers in this particular configuration with these crossover settings and these EQ parameters are going to, uh, to get. Now, you know, one other question for you, Nick, could you potentially look at the sub equalization and maybe add an EQ band at that, where that null is and see if you can make it, it any yeah. better? Yep. Yeah. yeah, possibly. Um, I like to do those kinds of things in isolation. So let's. So here's the sub ZQ. And uh, let's grab one of these and just scoot it up. And I might not want to run such a high Q. I know a couple guys that might be watching that that little no might really bother them. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> ho hopefully what they get out of these are, are the overall concepts right, not, right. <laughs> you know oh that's how i can do that you know not right so our focus is on obviously aligning the time and we saw that there was a discrepancy in time and it showed up as a as a an abnormality if you could call it that in the the summed response as well um it's not a result of the time issue necessarily there's some other weird things with the equalization which does affect phase right yep so. And you can see that the phase trace is actually closer to, to the, the other line than it was before with that, that change on the EQ. So and, I'm going to capture the sub response again. And but we could expect this to be some slightly better as a result of the change in the EQ. And look at that. And how, mu how many dB of output did we gain from that, Nick? Um, 4.38. That's you mean 4 dB? Yeah, at in the transition region, that is massive. That well, is it's at 80 hertz. It's local, 4 dB locally. At yeah, well, that's still a lot of information. <laughs> it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. So that's, I, I think, um, hopefully the takeaway for the audience is that, you know, we, we played with, we showed a polarity inversion and what that does to a phase trace. 
we showed uh, a change in delay and we saw what that did to the phase trace and now mm -hmm. we saw an equalizer and what that does to a phase trace. I'd love to see if we have an opportunity to show what an all pass does. I want to show you guys something else though, real quick. Um, what we did here, see, do you see this ripple? In fact, here, let me just, this is just like an academic cur curiosity kind of thing. <clears throat> do you see the, uh, the ripple in, in the response in the phase response right here? Where it goes down and then comes back up and it goes yeah, down. Yeah, that little ripple. So the orange response, this one, was what we had before we applied Matt's EQ. So remember, EQ shifts the phase, right? right? And a lot of people are afraid of EQ. They think because it has an impact on phase and they think that it's a bad thing. Um, but actually, what we did by applying that EQ is it, it made that deviation in the acoustic phase less severe. So not only did it flatten the or kind of linearize the response of the of the subwoofers uh, frequency response, it, it also made its phase response less, uh, you know, less deviation in the phase. It's more of an ideal phase response than it was before uh, applying that EQ. So the overall point here is just that um, the fact that EQs shift phase, that's not a negative thing. Right. It's not a bad thing. It's a steady yeah. thing. It's, it's a good thing, actually, because it's the opposite of what the speaker is doing. So yeah, it's a it's a beneficial thing. It would not be good if I, you know, had an EQ that only affected the magnitude and not the phase. That would be less than optimal. Um, yeah, got it. Well, it depends on what I was using the EQ for, right? So what you're saying is a lot of times what you see in phase can be directly correlated to what you would see in the frequency response, but not always. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Not always. It depends on whether or not that uh, the the phase response is. You know, it's like a strong reflection. Um, right. Then they, it could be that, yeah, that's not that's a non-minimum phase portion of the frequency response or something like that. But generally, the the ripples that you see in the phase response they have a direct correlation to ripples in the frequency response. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So, Steve, you said something about all pass. I'd love to see if we can. Um, hopefully, there's a, a a need for it. But if not, can we force it just so we could show what that does and how that would show up in phase? Um, sure, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, let's let me think about this for just a second. Well, one one thing that often happens is, um, you know, it would well. What, well, I suppose there's a couple ways we could go about doing that. So potentially the left or right mid range may yeah. have something. We yeah, you could just you could just. Um, place an all-pass filter on purpose in one of the mid-bass responses. And then uh, that would be like a mimic of sometimes acoustically what you have is uh, here. Let me get these other ones up there. So sometimes acoustically what you have is I think it's the near. Is it the near side? I always forget. Um, one of the two mid-bass speakers um, sometimes will have an acoustic effect that's like, let's see, 148 hertz. So... <clears throat> So because this car doesn't seem to really need one, we're going to fake it. <laughs> we're going to force it so you can see what it looks like in the phase uh, domain and the resulting summation that you would get if there was an all-pass applied and you didn't. Um, what it, In my brain, I counteracted by playing a similar one on the opposite channel. Um, yeah, so in some <clears> – <throat> what I did there on the phase was – I remember I was rolling it before. I was I was – using my up down arrow keys to roll the phase graph around. I just came over here to the Y axis and double clicked it to reset it where zeros at the middle. Um, anyway, what I did just now was I applied an all pass filter to this speaker. And the reason I did that was uh, just for demonstration purposes, because this, yeah, this car doesn't have that scenario with the mid bases. Sometimes, sometimes there's a, there's a situation where, and even I'm thinking about this, maybe like with two way systems too, where the, where the door mounted speaker has to extend a little higher. Uh, but anyway, sometimes there's a scenario where one speaker will have a wrap uh, in the phase response like this. That so when you say wrap, actually, I was hoping you'd mention that name. So uh, right now the all pass is on mm -hmm. and I can see the phase has a, the phase trace has a certain shape to it, has a certain look to it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the RTA response, the blue line on the bottom has a certain shape and look to it. Mm -hmm. Can you toggle the all pass off? So you'll notice the blue trace didn't change at all, but the phase trace, the red trace on the top did. And it looked like where it, it kind of went off the bottom of the, the graph and came back to the top. That's what Nick is talking about, a wrap. 
that wrap has gone away. So the all pass put a wrap in where there was none before. Yeah. So you're looking at phase, if you see a wrap on one channel and you don't see it on the other, you could put it on the one that doesn't have it to make it match the phase of the other channel. It's very difficult to get rid of a, a, a wrap that's on a, a channel. The best you could hope for is to match it on the opposite one. Yeah, yeah. So if I capture this phase response and then turn that on, you'll see more easily where it, yeah, it there you go. See, that's what it did. So 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 sometimes what I just in, induced on purpose electrically, that will be happening acoustically. And so what'll happen sometimes is you'll have you'll have this acoustically on one speaker. Right? Let me hide that capture. And so now we'll capture this as if as if that were our real acoustic reality. And then you'll have this on the other side that, see, it doesn't have that effect right here. It doesn't have that. And then so the green one is the captured one with the forced all pass behavior. And the yeah. red one is the live trace of the, the current uh, speaker that doesn't have that. And you can see that the alignment at those frequencies are about 180 degrees out. So it's almost like a polarity inversion, but over a very narrow range. Yep, it's just like that. Yeah, as far as the, its effect on the summed response. Yeah. So um, if I come back here and let me let me capture this one more time. So so he's capturing the blue trace of the one with the all pass behavior. Yeah. Now he's going to capture the blue trace. Well, the, the old one is purple, and this new one will uh, capture that one. Yep. And that'll be some new color, right? So it's like a purpley pink kind of color. And when he sums them together, look at that notch right around where that cancellation looks like. Yep. That drop in output is a result of the the phase inversion between the, the left and right driver in this case, right? Yep. Yeah. So if that were my acoustic reality, then what I could do is on, whoops, sorry, on this speaker right here, I could add an equivalent amount of phase shift such that it overlays our other speaker. And then you would have a, a you know, I, more ideal summation um, across its bandwidth instead of having that notch right there. So Let's that, take a look. Can you do that? Right there. Um, yeah. Actually, ca capture that that sum trace with the, the um, bad behavior, so to speak. So that's that one. And then, uh, and then, so let me come to this. So this speaker here is the live one. The so red trace on the top, right? Yep. If we were to put an all pass filter in, you know, so how would you know where to find the all pass? Like, how would you determine that frequency? Oh, uh, OK. Let me turn this off real quick. Well, it's 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 pretty easy. You just put your cursor right where. So I'm on the red one, but I'm looking at the the vertical cursor and I'm placing it right where the green deviates, where it goes off the bottom and jumps back on the top. So I'm placing it right in the middle of that deviation. Then I look at the frequency readout. It says 149.3. So you could just come right down here and type in 149.3. And then uh, and then the Q, I think our default Q, what is our default Q? 1.44? 1. 1. 1. Something like that, yeah. Um, so what, what I would do with the Q is, you know, I'd raise it up just a little bit. to where You see how those traces are now lining up with the green one better on the phase on the top? That's what we're looking for. We want to align them in time as much as possible across that entire region where the, the pink fuzzy stuff is flat across the top and not coming down. Those are the, the face traces that we care about. And the closer we align those, the better the summation. The closer we get to that four plus three equals seven again, right? Yeah, so if, uh, so if I unmute them both at the same time now, that little null goes away. So that would be, you know, the same exact phenomenon occurs when you have uh, all pass behavior that's induced acoustically. Unfortunately, this car doesn't display that. Doesn't have a problem, so we had to fake it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but that yeah, that's that's precisely um, one potential use of one potential use. One potential use. That's awesome. So um, we're kind of at our time, and I think this was a really good uh, example of how to look at phase to to improve summation, which is ultimately um, what we're going for. Remember, there's three pillars of audio in, if you're trying to get staging and imaging from a two-channel system, and it's going to be level, magnitude, and time. Phase is time. Now, you could look at level and magnitude and try to figure this out blind, or you could just look at the time domain and, and see those traces. And when they line up, it's, it's I, I like jumping the gun sometimes, and I knew it was going to look better already because I saw the phase traces lined up.
and you, you get excited about being able to get those traces lined up. And you know, Rob and I are kind of kid like in that bit. And that when I see it lining up like that, I just think, wow, this is so cool to see it in real time. Um, I, I think we can stop here. And this is this is kind of I, I fall victim to this when I'm tuning cars. I get the mid base drivers lined up good, match them up to the sub, and I'll glance at the mid range and say, yeah, that looks pretty good, but I want to listen to it now. <laughs> and that's when Nick gets mad at me. He's like, oh, it doesn't take that much longer to go up to the higher frequencies. And of course, we spent a lot of time explaining some of this so that hopefully you got a better understanding of it. Um, but the next step would be looking at the mid range drivers to each other, making sure they line up to the mid base. Then the tweeters relative to each other, making sure they line up to the mid range. Remember, though, as you go up the range, you don't want to change anything you did on the lower octaves because that'll break some of their interactions. So you only want to make the changes at the higher uh, frequencies then. Yep. Well, Scott Williams, we're not going to go on for 12 more hours, but he doesn't want us to stop. He's got the long drive from Kansas to Vegas right now. I want to know how he's looking at the phase traces while he's driving. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Rob, I didn't see a whole lot of chatter in the chat, um, but I think, you know, we normally tend to run long. So um, I'm wondering if we can open it up for some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nothing, um, let's see, nothing really related to the phase. Nick obviously just killed it. Everyone understands this. They're all Nick level geniuses now when it comes to working with phase. That'd be nice. <laughs> um, uh, question that just came in from Andy asking, um, first of all, thank you for the compliment on the great content. That's uh, always our goal <laughs> to uh, provide content to uh, not just educate, but, you know, make it fun and easy to understand. So uh, thank you for that. But are any plans on larger drivers in the near future? Oh, yeah, I've been eating. I'm getting larger every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, man. Um, in terms of specific designs of uh, our speakers and whatnot, um, there's always things in process. Um, I honestly don't know of any specific larger diameter drivers that are uh, being planned, but our engineering team is always working on different things. Um, I don't want to say they're chaotic in their approach, but they have lots of ideas and they'll start chasing down some ideas. Who knows? Maybe one day we will have a larger driver. But right now our plan is um, on a number of other projects that I'm aware of that that are coming down, you know, down in the future at some point. Um, so, Andy, keep watching the space. We're always working on stuff. I can't promise you a larger driver, but I can promise you some really cool stuff. So. Great question that just came in from Tim. I had a mid base cancellation like your example. But when I apply an all pass on the left mid base, the sound stage will shift to the right. What am I doing wrong? That's all you, Nick. <laughs> the other things that, well, I guess, first of all, we might want a little bit more context. Um, when, when you apply the, well, yeah, we'll, at what frequency range is this um, effect occurring? How severe is it? And how severe is the magnitude dip that you get when the when you sum the two? Um, that would be some stuff I would be curious about. And uh, and then the other thing I would be curious is about is um, sometimes in the impulse response. So if you were to look at the kind of signature of the impulse response, you'll have this initial arrival. But then you've got all this Show screen, Rob. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't really see he was using that. Here we go. There we go. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, you've got this initial arrival, but you've got all this other energy that that's coming very, very shortly after that. And the the total combined energy in this entire like beginning area of this impulse response is kind of what you perceive. And sometimes um, sometimes you can look at two. I like to look at it in the log. You can look at two log log IRs and one might have a very different uh decay than the other. And when you engage and disengage that all pass filter, it can change the, the shape of the of the impulse response after the initial arrival. And that could be why you're hearing the image pull to one side versus the other when it's engaged versus when it's disengaged. Um, but one thing that I've, I've noticed that as well, what what you're talking about, not usually at these lower frequencies, but when I've had all pass filters a little higher than that, um, and sometimes what, what I'll do is whenever I apply an all pass filter during the analysis portion, like we're doing now, 
or, or anything like anything that might be questionable that I'm doing during the analysis portion while listening, I will um, bypass it. Right. So while listening, I'll bypass it and then turn it back on, bypass it, turn it back on. And if it sounds better one way than the other, then that's the way I leave it. You know, I use the analysis portion as a means of optimizing all of the alignments of all the speakers so that I know that there's not any gross destructive interference going on one speaker to the other. But then the ultimate kind of arbiter of uh, how these things should be set is while I'm listening. So I'll listen and I'll kind of like with subwoofer EQ, a lot of times I'll apply subwoofer EQ kind of like we did just now, right? Um, to get the subwoofer shape a little bit more textbook like so that I can more clearly see how it interacts with the mid bass. I can more clearly see the crossover interaction. Um, but then especially if, if a lot of the subwoofer EQ that I've done was, was cutting um, while listening, sometimes I'll bypass some or all of the subwoofer EQ. And if I like it better, or if the customer likes it better with the sub EQ bypassed, then I'll just leave it that way. You know, so, so some some of these tools that we use during the analysis portion are just so we can get a better view in a better insight into how these things are interacting. But it doesn't mean you always have to leave them all engaged. That's a really good point. A couple of things I'll add while, while you're sharing that uh, Tim did reply. The the ripple that he described is about one and a half dB and it's right around 300. So it kind of lines up with what you're saying It's happening at a slightly higher frequency, just That's like you're bad. saying. And that uh, you've also heard similar effects, and it, it's related to everything you just described. But I think the most important thing you shared is not only that Tim's issue is something that, you know, it, it seems to make a lot of sense, is that ultimately what we care about is not making sure these lines all look pretty, is that it sounds good. So even if the lines are perfect, ultimately the last thing, and in our tuning process, the second to last thing is to listen to the system and make changes based on the way it sounds. Um, the goal here with the objective analysis, you know, the um, lining up of targets, you know, you, you match your response to the targets, you get your levels lined up and you get your time lined up. All of these are numbers. You're getting the numbers to line up, but we don't listen to numbers. We listen to music. So once you get those numbers lined up, if you could do that rapidly, you could get in the seat and start listening and making real changes. Now, what you should probably notice when you're getting in and listening to things you shouldn't be making massive changes to any one aspect of things because if you are something is definitely wrong with the system at that point if everything lined up in the objective analysis the frequency response all lined up levels all lined up and time all lined up you should be making minor changes based on your preferences we call it salt and pepper at that point you're seasoning the meal to your preference but you're not going to recook the whole darn meal you're not going to completely start over during that listening phase. If you find yourself making huge changes, you might want to go revisit your data because I would bet that something's probably wrong somewhere in that. Yep. Yeah. So, um, just to go a little bit more into, into his question. So if we look at this impulse response right here, you remember I was saying sometimes the, the energy um, after the initial arrival, right, can change when you apply or not or disengage the all pass. So look at these kind of big humps that we have right right back here. Can we see your screen again, please? There oh, we go. <laughs> sorry. I didn't no, you're good, Nick. We're good. So this is, this is, you know, you're hearing this, right? This is com contributing to what to what you hear, to where you how you localize that sound. So watch when I turn off the all pass filter. See that? Now now look at this. now let me capture this one. Okay, now I'm going to turn that all pass filter back on. See? So I did not uh, change the level on the RTA. I didn't change the level of the speaker at all, but I did definitely change the uh, amount of energy as a function of time coming from that speaker. And so if you have one speaker that has a, a, a decay more like this and the other one's more like this, but they have a same level down here on the RTA, this okay. second one, this red one, it could be perceived as a little louder as kind of pull, like, you know, and it doesn't take much to pull that image one way or the other. It's right. not like a huge level difference that causes our awareness to like, you know, go mm -hmm. one way or the other. So, so there he goes, a good example of how uh, the all pass filter can actually change the, the decay, the acoustic decay of the speaker and that, that can pull the image one, one way or another. All right. Thank you. So, um, Aaron in Scottsdale is asking, how do I get Nick to tune my system? Uh, reach out to me. I do take a 10% cut of any <laughs> charges, but I'll get Nick out to you. No. Um, in all seriousness, we do have a good amount of dealers uh, in our area. I know Nick, especially in the Phoenix area, has worked uh, with a lot of them. 
So definitely um, check out our dealers, and I'm sure if they have questions, they can uh, get get a, a hold of uh, Nick if needed. Um, here's a good question that came in um, uh, saying, when measuring delay with impulse response, sometimes the subjective listening center image position isn't accurately centered when the drivers are aiming on axis versus off axis. Is that possible or was uh, there a wrong measurement process? Um, so what, what I found after doing this kind of stuff for a long time is, um, is that once you've aligned the speakers via impulse response or, or like, you know, if, if you did it even with physical measurements and there was no other unaccounted for delays, and you were pretty accurate about the relative uh, measurements and whatever, as long as you got everything, you know, arriving at the same time, you accounted for the distance differences and, and all that stuff. Um, then generally shifting uh, the image comes down to level um, in my experience. Um, so I would say that it's, it's uh, like what I do when I'm done with the analysis portion is I get in the vehicle and I listen and depending on where the image is manifesting, I will, I will link um, like my left and right tweeter or sorry, my left tweeter and left mid base together and I'll use my arrow keys and raise them up and, and, you know, raise their level up, raise their level down um, and kind of get a, get a mental fix on what is being changed. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll just get more gentle with the up and down, uh, adjustments until it kind of lands somewhere where the image is placed where I want it. So, um, yeah. So a after after proper um, timing alignment, uh, it's comes down to level is is my experience with and that <clears throat> with image placement. And that also is assuming that there isn't any gross differences in stuff like what we just talked about with the. Um, all pass filter chain, like grossly changing the shape of the impulse response just after the initial, the initial arrival. And there isn't any gross differences in the uh, RTA response, the shape of each, uh, of each response. If the tweeters, um, shape the same and the mid ranges are shaped the same and the mid bases are shaped the same and your timing alignment is, you know, optimized via either analysis or really accurate tape measure, I suppose that not quite as accurate in my opinion, but whatever, if the alignment is on, uh, the timing is on, you know, and the RTA responses are on, then um, image placement is a function of level generally. That, that's what I found. Yeah, I'd imagine that uh, the difference with on and off axis, you might be seeing more reflection from one than the other, and that could account for that, that potential level difference, uh, even though the time may look about right, because we can kind of resolve through some of the reflections when, when looking um, at phase. I, I might have missed a part of that question was there's was the speakers having a different axis part of that yeah on and on uh, drivers being on axis versus off axis so um, like the near side driver is very off and the far side driver is more on possibly it's kind of the way i read it too natana mm -hmm. is a really good system tuner down from um he's uh, i think he's in the philippines i can't remember where he's at uh somewhere in asia is really really good so this, this question is from him uh, um, so, so. yeah uh, well okay so if i add that to the equation, right? Which I wasn't thinking of originally. Um, that's something I've, I've noticed as well. And I think my best answer to that is try not to install speakers in such a manner. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, uh, yeah. I've seen that too, where, you know, like um, say you've got some a pillar pods or something, you got like a mid range and a tweeter on, on one a pillar and a mid range and a tweeter on the other. And they're the, the one that's near you, you're almost looking at the edge of the speaker basket. Right, like the edge of it. You don't. Right. You, if you could see the speaker, maybe it's got a grill over it or something. But if you could see it, you couldn't even really see the cone because you're so far off to the edge of it. And then the other one on the far side, if you look over at it, you can totally see the front of the speaker. Like when that's the case, yeah, it 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 can take a little extra adjusting of of level. But again, it's level. Again, right. I right. yeah, it's still level for me anyway. That's the way I've always found it. And to add to that, um, this probably goes without saying for Natan, but the center mic in the whatever mic method that you're using whether it's an array or a single mic needs to be placed in the center of that seat to where where the driver's height is accurate or you're going to have a different sound where you sit if it's not the same position as your you know where your nose is or between right. your ears so that's very important 
Yep, that's that's a good point, Matt. Before I put the mic array in the car, whatever um, the you know whoever owns the vehicle, I always have the customer sit in the vehicle, and I just take a couple pieces of tape real quick and mark uh, duct tape right off the where they're where they're here. <laughs> that's a really good point. He, um, I remember Nick doing that. He would sit me in the car and he would take masking tape and he kind of line it up, it the tip of my nose, both on the the roof and on the the pillar of the car, so that he could triangulate in and and get that that position as close as he possibly could. Um, I saw something from uh, Kenneth Wright. You mind putting that one up there, Rob? Yep. Um, he's mentioning a center image in a studio um, that isn't where a driver is sitting in a car, right? Um, if, if I understand what he's saying, that you know, if if you're in a studio, you're equal distance between two speakers, and the center image is directly in front of you. But if you're offset, so I'm going to the left in, in my car, Natan's going to the right in his car. Um, we're off center. So should the center image be in front of us, or should be it? in the middle of the car um well my my answer to that where should it be i that's in my opinion it should be between the two speakers just so, like in the studio but you don't have the luxury of sitting there right, right. right. <laughs> you can yeah so if you align a, a system like in a car if you align all the speakers in time and frequency and level and stuff what ends up happening people might debate whether this is right or wrong, you know, subjectively, but objectively what, like what ends up happening is that the, anything that's recorded center in the recording that's correlated between left and right, it shows up. It, if you close your eyes and listen, it shows up at a point in space between the two speakers. It doesn't show up in front of your face. It shows up at a point in space between the two speakers. And um, I think that's probably ideal in my opinion, because if you did then take steps and you could to move that image over to where it was in front of you, then um, you'd have a very compressed, like small uh, from center to the left. If, if you're yeah. in the US and you're in the driver's seat and then you'd very have weird banded from center to right. So the sound stage kind of keeps its regular proportions. Uh, it's just that you're now sitting off to the left. Uh, that's what it comes down to. My old car, when I first started playing around with DSP, when I put my old tweak in it, um, you know, this was all new to me, tuning and principle. So, you know, my first thought was, well, I need the center image in front of me. That's the center. And I noticed when I had everything center at, say, my steering wheel, like Nick said, you had this really compressed sound stage, and then something very wide on the passenger side. And you can hear the difference. Everything's really squishy here. But this very, you have a nice spatial on the on the right side. Whereas if we move that center image to the center, and it's like you're just sitting off to the side at a concert venue or something. Now you have like this even sound stage. There's no oddness to each side. Everything's balanced left to right. And yeah, it might be weird, you know, if you're coming from the studio or the smug two channel world where you got your nice scotch or whiskey in between <laughs> some nice towers on axis and equal distance. But when you get into the car with all the weird things that happens in the car, having that center image, while it might not be where you're used to, you're going to make sure, though, everything else left to right is it's balanced. You don't have any squishiness on one side like Nick talked about and the other side that's wider or outside of the car than, you know, outside of the car than you may want. So um, it does come down to preference. But I think in terms of overall accuracy, I'd rather have it center with equal left right sound staging instead of messing with the width of it by trying to adjust my center image at least my, that's what i found i quickly got rid of that preset yeah <laughs> well it is interesting that you can experiment around with that and yeah. see for yourself but uh, i tend to agree that equal distance between the speakers uh essentially the same as it if it, if it was at a home audio system and you weren't sitting in the middle um that that would be ideal right mm -hmm. cool get anything else the squishiness i love these technical terms that very technical yes <laughs> uh, i think one more that came in and we'll end with this um andy had asked of course i lost it because i kicked myself out of our studio real quick you want me to show it i got it okay yeah uh yep there this it one? is yep do you guys believe passive crossovers are more of a thing of the past with all the dsp flexibility and features we have today I don't think so. I think uh, uh, we're seeing, obviously, DSPs becoming more and more prevalent. We're going to see it, I would imagine, in the future at lower price points, which then makes it more appealing to everyone. 
Um, but there is a simplicity of using passive networks. And even though we've done a lot with Tune and Max to really simplify this process, not everyone's computer savvy. Not everyone has the hardware to, to play with DSP. I mean, in a perfect world, I would love that every system had DSP in it because you really do get everything out of it. But that's not what everyone's looking for. You know, I found when I worked in retail, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I found also with tuning, you know, the more accurate or pr precise we make a system, it's not always as fun as you may want it to be as we're aiming to, you know, tune to targets. You know, maybe you want that aggressiveness that tuning to a curve would take out and, you know. I think for like the customers that want fun, they want loud, they want dynamic, they might not care about the phase alignment of their drivers, you know, and there's price points as well. So Scott says, <laughs> so Scott's I think th fan. there's always going to be a market for it, um, whether it's DIYers or hardware. Um, and I don't think using passives is a bad thing. It all really just comes down to what your personal goals are with your system at the end of the day. And remember, at some point you could always ditch them if you decide to upgrade to a DSP and go active then. So, you know, you're not locked into them. I'll, I'll add one thing that, that, that maybe it wasn't touched on, but uh, you can still use a lot of these techniques yes. and uh, DSP tuning to align something with a passive network. You don't have the benefit of doing it with the separate drivers, but very often that that, that critical mid base to subwoofer transition, even if the mid base is extending into the mid range and up to the upper frequencies, that alignment with the subwoofer really does benefit from this uh, phase alignment that, that Nick just walked us through. So even if you're using the passive network, you still get a benefit. Um, and then, you know, Rob's point is that down the road, if you wanted to ditch the passives and add some additional amplifier channels to cover the tweeter or the other, the other components that, that are part of that, uh, that, that multi-way audio system, you don't have to throw anything else away. You just, you know, add to it and get more, right? <laughs> Sorry, Nick I got to share the thought. <laughs> Nick looking like a stepdad that's disappointed for using passives. Oh man, we gotta use passives. Right? <laughs> All right. So hey, Rob, I agree that was a pretty good place to to stop, you know, having that conversation there. Um, this doesn't end our conversation. We're always available for additional comments that you guys may have for us. Um, you could reach out to the technical department if you have any questions related to the product itself and then you know how to use it more effectively. That's uh, technical at jlaudio.com. Training department, what's our email again, Rob? training at jlaudio.com fantastic and uh we're always open for any suggestions you may have in terms of content to cover and you know we're even open to suggestions if you want a different day of the week or a different time of day uh just know that we're kind of on split coast here so it gets a little squirrely but we're always uh looking forward to hearing from all of you any questions you may have any suggestions you may have so uh on that note i'm gonna say goodbye so thank you all for watching and i'll see you next time thanks everybody thanks for joining Thanks for your time today, Nick. I know you're a busy guy, so it's Absolutely. always a treat when you get to hang out with us. I like it. Thanks. <laughs> All cool. right. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>